Welcome back to In Conversation with Rockwater with me, Sophie Corbett, and our chat with Dame Kelly Holmes. When we left off, we had been speaking about her homecoming parade and what it felt like having 80,000 people cheering for her. As we rejoin, we will learn more about her fitness and her experiences coming out in the documentary, Kelly Holmes, Being Me. So, you're obviously still very fit. You are... (laughs) (laughs) Woohoo! All right, all right. No, you are. You are obviously still very fit. And and I don't... You're saying that in this audience. (laughs) I am. Yeah. Um, Thanks, guys. And you shouldn't have a thing about your age either, whilst we're on the subject. No, okay. Listen to me, Auntie Sophie. Um, No, you are obviously still very fit and... So how often do you exercise now? <laughs> no, I, I actually, to be honest, I haven't done a lot lately because, well, no, I've been away on holiday three weeks and I made sure it was an active holiday because uh, I wasn't actually doing a lot before because even though no. I, I completely believe in exercise helping your mental health, which I do, whether that's walking, doing whatever, I really yeah. believe in that. Also, time, like life, sometimes just literally gets in the way. Yeah. And I've been so tired that actually going out training, I'm just going to get worse, if you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that, you go it's around a, vicious, a balance. visual circus, I think. A vicious circ- uh, circle. Circus. A vicious circus. <laughs> I yeah. really didn't have many gins upstairs. No. <laughs> just we one didn't. We two. haven't had no, anything. We haven't. No, we haven't. Um, um, no, so, no, I do believe in that. So I don't. I don't keep as fit at the moment as I'd like to, but I've always been quite naturally fit anyway. So yeah. I am in a mission to get back to it now. Yeah. Now the doc's out of the way. The doc was really stressful. Yeah. Um, I t- yeah, we'll get... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go into one because I want you to keep... I your love that you're sticking with my plan. Sticking with your plan because I don't want to phase you. Yeah, it's... I, it, I help, thank you. I really appreciate it. <laughs> um, and do you miss competing? No, I watched the Commonwealth Games. I was like, uh-uh, no. No, great. No. Gone, done it, done. been there, got the T-shirt. Been there and done it is the yeah. word I Won keep having to use. It yeah. makes me feel much better that yeah. I'm old and can't do it anymore because I really wish I could. No. You're did really anyone, not Did old. anyone see, you know, I don't know when this mm. podcast is coming out. It'll probably be cut, so I'm going to ask a question. Did anyone see Sport Relief um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. attached to the Commonwealth Games? Um, I think I could go do gymnastics. I did a nice round off when we won. I'm, I bet you could. <laughs> I'm joking. The other day, I hu- I'm sorry to talk about me and then I'll shut up because really I know I'm interviewing Kelly. But I, you know, when you dead hang, uh-huh. so somebody said to me, You're very fit if you can dead hang for over a minute and f- 15 seconds. So oh I was in gosh. France and my youngest is training to be a boxer, actually. So that's what I was talking to you about the loneliness of training when you're mm-hmm. on your own. And he said, I've, do, I've gone to the pull-up bar. And I said, where is it? I need a dead hang. <laughs> <laughs> so in the south of France, hot. I dead hung yeah. for one minute, 28 seconds. Wow. Oh, that's good. That's amazing. So you could do gymnastics and I could do dead hanging. There we go. All the way. Anyway, sorry. No, so any, anyway, yeah, was... moving on, swiftly on. Um, Going back to the documentary, because yes. <clears throat> I, I just thought it was beautiful. And it, it came across in the documentary how close you are to your, f- your friends and your family. Mm-hmm. Um, so you grew up with your mum, Pam, mm-hmm. and your stepdad, Michael, who you call dad, and your brothers and sisters. Did I get this wrong in the documentary that it was your stepdad who was the first person you told you thought you might be gay? No, correct. Uh, correct. Mm-hmm. And how long a gap was it till you told anyone else? Because I thought Nearly I might. Ten years. I thought I might have heard that wrong, and I went back and I kept hearing it, and then I thought, have I got it wrong? I'm get... So I thought it was that. So you must have had such a close relationship with him. I didn't know who else to speak to. No, quite... he was your. Mm, I just yeah. I mean, at the time, <sighs> about going too de- too much depth, wasn't really speaking to my mother at the time. Right. Um. So 
he was your person. Yeah, and I didn't really know who to talk to because when you're young, you've left home. You know, I was in the army. Yeah. This became quite evident to me that I may be gay. Yeah. And I didn't couldn't talk about it as such, you know, just openly. Other than no. you know this like and was it like spoken word, one so conversation, spoke. or did he bring it up occasionally to talk to you, or did it? it was no, just I wrote like, him a letter. You wrote him a letter. That was right. He wrote. I wrote him a letter. Then called him. He says, "I'm going to come up." I was like, "You really don't have to." Like I was up in Leconsfield on um, uh, my H. I actually joined the army as an HGB driver. Um, so I know, I, that's amazing. <laughs> so I was desperate to get in, clearly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I joined and then he said he's going to come all the way up. I said, you really don't need to. You know, I was like, no, I'm not having my dad come up there. He'd already embarrassed me in basic training. I have to tell you this story. <laughs> you do. So we had basic training and uh, so it's at Guildford. It used to be at Guildford. And basic training is where you meet everybody you're going to be in a platoon with. You're all sort of 17, 18, 19. We were in the Royal Army. Uh, uh, in the uh, Women's Royal Army Corps. <laughs> and uh, you have your passing out parade. Now, the passing out parade is like, you know, Saxon, you ha- you've got to get it right. This yeah. is like where you go out, you do your whole proper parade, the parade squares, all done up really l- lovely. No one is allowed to step foot on that parade square until you're marched on for pass out. So everyone's getting ready, you know, you've got all your kit, you feel really proud that you've got through training. And somebody started screaming. And everyone ran towards the window. And they went, oh, my God, somebody's driving across the parade square. <laughs> Who do you think that was? <laughs> Mick, my dad, <laughs> driving with a sergeant behind. Going, <laughs> yeah, oh. This is the most embarrassing part of my life ever. Never let it go. No. He wants to drive up to Beaconsfield to see me. No. No. no, thanks, no. Dad. No, but anyway, I'm yeah. okay. He, yeah, so I told him, but it was just more to just tell someone that I'd met. I don't know why. Yeah. I just felt I needed to, and then Absolutely. I didn't tell anyone else until I had left the army, yeah. and that was my two brothers and my sister Lisa and Kerry, my friend. Yeah, just don't. I suppose I just become friends with the people that you we lived with. We lived, worked. You know, you become really close with those people anyway. They're your community. Yeah. Um, they're, your, they're your comrades. They're, they're your family, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, your family. Time. So, yeah, I didn't need that. And then, obviously, I left the military and I didn't have really anyone else then to be involved with as such. So then I needed, you know, that support. Um, yeah. yeah, from your from your, sis, your siblings. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because, again, at that stage, I'd left the army. I had already um, medalled at multi-championships. I was gay. Uh, there was a, still this ban on the army, it's still illegal. Yeah. I didn't know how to be me at all. Like, literally, when I left the army, I didn't know how to be me at all. didn't know what I needed to do to no. be me. So I just got behind athletics. I suppose athletics became my saviour in a way. No one asked me anything else because it's all about performance. Yeah, they that's were how I've lived all your my speed. life. Yeah, about yeah. It, yeah, your training and your. Yeah. I've lived all my life without having to say the bit that was the worst part of me, you know. The, bit, the best the part. Best part. Oh, yeah, yeah, the best part. Yeah, the best part. We'll take that. Yeah, I'll take that. But it all, so it all, I'm, I'm having to jump. It's so upsetting. I wish I could speak to you for three weeks. Um, <laughs> but I'm having to fit it in this evening. So I'm kind of jumping about. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm going to jump to 2020 when it all came tumbling down mm-hmm. for you. And you just, you hit a wall. You couldn't cope with it anymore. Can we speak about that? Yeah. To find it very difficult. I'm interviewing you, and I know it's a really important thing we need to talk about. <clears throat> Just hope I don't cry. Um, but yeah, can we speak about what happened and the culmination of, of, of that? Happened? Yeah, so uh, we had lockdown. Everyone was just like, what the hell is yeah. going on? The world was going nuts. Uh, we were all stuck and doing some worse than others. So I was yeah. very lucky, had a garden, had things to do, and I felt very lucky in lockdown, to be honest. Then I got the first bout of COVID, mm-hmm. and I got it quite bad. Mm. And I was really ill for three weeks or so, and was just sort of laying on my sofa, and that's a lot like me, because when lockdown started, I started my fitness community, Military Emotion. I'm doing, like, live fitness sessions every morning. Seven. Oh, no, I was showing my alpaca boys first, 
videoing them. And then I was doing like mm. core sessions. So I was like probably the fittest I'd been for ages. You know, I'm like yeah. up for it. I'm like, right, got loads of time to myself, yeah. keep fit. Got stuck with COVID, uh, really ill. And I remember laying there. And you know, when we kept seeing the news and all these people dying and like, mm. it was awful. Mm. Yeah, it's frightening. You know, and whatever you think about what the news was bringing you, it's still frightening to think this could be happening. And I just laid there thinking, Obviously, one day I'm going to die, but I don't want to die with people. I know that my friends and family would be at, it sounds really morbid, but be at my funeral saying, isn't it a shame she couldn't live her life how she, she wants to live it? Yeah. You know, isn't it a shame Kelly just couldn't be her? And I remember thinking, oh, I don't want other people talking about me. It's my right to talk about me, but how do I do it? And I was really scared because I just thought, I don't want to have a life where everybody else is sort of being there saying all of my glory stuff, but actually the truth about who I wanted to yeah. be. Because obviously my friends and family have known since I was, what, 27. So um, that was the start of it, to be honest. Yeah. Well, it wasn't necessarily a start. So the actual, probably starting point was when my mum passed away from myeloma. Like, sorry. absolutely devastated me, mm. broke me, still does to this mm -hmm. day. I don't believe you get, I don't believe time's a healer. I think you learn to deal with things differently and live life in a different way. I really suffered from that. That was the start of me trying to change. Like I had an undercut, my hair was a lot longer. I had an undercut on the day of her funeral. I just thought, I've got to do something. I started wearing what I wanted to wear, but I still couldn't be me, you know? It was like, in my yeah. head I wanted to, but I couldn't. I didn't know how to articulate it. So anyway, that was probably the start. And then this happened to COVID. Then I wasn't exercising as much. I was getting really down in the dumps. Um, yeah. And I got to the Christmas and lost the plot, basically. I, well, actually, no, I mean, God, because when you think about how long it's taken now, it wasn't, that wasn't actually the thing. So, um, yeah, I got to the Christmas. I remember laying in bed one night and absolutely broken, thought I was going to start self-harming again. I actually stopped the the day my mum died, I stopped self-harming because I believed that she didn't have another day to live and I should be living life. So I stopped self-harming that day. But this night, yeah, I thought I was going to lose it. And I was like literally holding myself in bed with one side of me wanting to go down and really harm myself and yeah. the other not. So I actually end up emailing at one o'clock in the morning this psychologist that I'd seen on a documentary I just googled a psychologist thought well she knew some she was doing it with another celeb so I thought well maybe she'd be okay because I never wanted yeah. to see even though I believe I should have seen a psychologist over my life I always had the fear that if I spoke to somebody they would out me so you're still so, well, yeah, yeah. yeah you're like that's so right, who should, do you trust they're, they're professionals you know yeah. but in my head the moment I open myself outside of my family and friend group and then I'm exposing myself so I never saw someone at all wow. because of that yeah, okay. but at this point I was desperate so I emailed she got back to me the next morning started seeing this woman uh, another message I'd say is like not everybody's right for you if you definitely talk to someone but find somebody that works for you absolutely she was good but she was almost like doubting whether I even thought I was gay like almost kind of like you know do I Am I, what's the word? Um, what's the word? I had it in the other day. She said to me, oh, come back to me. Anyway, it's like yeah. a word. And I was just like, no, I, <laughs> believe me, I know I'm gay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> believe me. Um, anyway, so I left her, kept working. I was using work as a way of coping. I was doing so much. I was doing a lot of online. Mo I did motivational speaker by trade. So yeah. I was doing that, but then it all went online. So it's just a computer in front of you trying to motivate everybody. I was just trying to just do so much. I literally was changing five times in a day because I was doing so much work yeah. from home. And then I remember doing this motivational talk and I'd open up the laptop and I was meant to be inspiring and motivating and talk about well-being and I literally opened up the laptop started doing the talk and I said I'm gonna tell I have to tell you I'm not in a good way today I literally told like there was yeah. a thousand people on that blooming thing and I'm just saying I'm not in a good way yeah but if I tell you that then 
I'm telling you as a human being that, and the whole point was about mental health and that I hadn't planned it. No. And they thought it was the best talk ever. Of course they did. The company were yeah. loving it because I'm now like, you know, having a breakdown in front of them and they're... <laughs> <laughs> and I'm completely hitting all the boxes, ticking everything off. But I just, I just closed that computer and I said, I can't work another day. And I had so much in my diary. I spoke to all uh, people that was with me, with P. I said, I, I can't. You've got to cancel everything. So I cancelled yeah. everything thinking. I went down to the bench where I have for my mum and I spoke to my best friend, Kerry, and says, I'm losing the plot. And she said, you've got to take time off. And I thought I was going to take three weeks off. I actually took 10 months off of work. Um, and that was until this year yeah um and then at the same time i was in talks to do a documentary because i needed to talk but being in the public eye that some people might think well why do you do documentaries do it because i'm still in the public eye so you can't just suddenly become a different person when you've had all of these worries and fears and um fear of judgment to yeah. suddenly live a life that no one knows you at it's it's hard to explain but i yeah. couldn't just do it i had to do it in a way that educates people to know why i've lived with this fear to know why it's been so hard for me to give a real big message to people generally yeah to know that you could be walking side by side with someone and not really know the true them that doesn't mean they're lying to you but not really know what's happening in their lives behind yeah yeah so absolutely. i needed to do it in this way so i was very fortunate that um somebody from itv said they'd want to do my story and that was then the journey over a few months to do it and yeah. then that's why i, I just I've, i i found your do i mean having i've kind of worked on documentaries and stuff and i what I found about your documentary, which I love, is it came from you. Mm -hmm. Quite often when ITV or BBC are doing documentary, they, they do their rhythm and it's always, it's like a saying, you're watching a similar thing that you've seen before. Yours wasn't. Mm -hmm. I knew you were in charge yep. of mm -hmm. what was in it. Yeah. And it just came across so openly and honest. And again, I'm going to say being so brave to be vulnerable, mm -hmm. you know, um, I just, I just, I adored it. I just thought it was amazing, and um, I just think you're brilliant for, for, because <laughs> no. it's, it's not easy. No. It's not easy what you did. If you subscribe to a fabric of life coloured by the sea, subscribe to Open Water from Rockwater for exclusive performances by international recording artists and world-class musicians, celebrity talks, and stand-up comedy, to film screenings by firesides, well-being workouts and beach-bound meditation. Open Water gives you exclusive access to the best that rock water has to offer. Played out over three floors, just a stone's throw from the water, with remarkable food and drink experiences for company. To find out more, contact the team today. Open water at rockwater.uk. Open water, made by the sea. But how did it feel when it had been aired? And now it's been aired. Don't worry, they're the ones we've done. Um, <laughs> it, it's a... Uh... No, really good. It was so hard. It was so hard. You know, there was hours and hours and hours of content and it was trying to put together. And I was very lucky that I had somebody that ended up getting me. I had a conversation with the producer. I said, this can't be how you want it to come across. It has to be how I feel it because I've lived it. You know, I need every aspect to really tell its truth. I mean, 45 minutes is quite hard, isn't it? You know, like... Can, how do you condense and get the right Very hard. language and the right purpose in it? Yeah. There's always things, you know, if you're perfectionist, you think you could have had that better, but it wasn't preconceived. It was purely from here. The hardest bit of it was the moment that I had to sit down at the opening scene. Oh, and, I was with and you. And then actually to say... Oh, my like, God. Okay, I... I, lo I no. I didn't know how to do it. I was crying for ages. They were trying to get me to say... I'm gay. But when you've never said it, it was so hard. It wasn't that I'm, you know. I, no, it w I could see it. Well, you could feel it. It came across. No, the first time I anything. cried in the opening of your documentary, I, could I, I was, not. I could, f you can feel it, couldn't you? Yeah. When you watched it, you could feel the nerve, yeah. the nerves. 
you know, in the fear you, yeah. that, that has gone back and back. And it's like part of you has to be so kind to yourself. You know mm-hmm. I mean, you have to be your own best friend. Yeah. And go, this isn't surprising. Mm-hmm. When you look or back there, like you were talking about the history of what people went, go through, what Emma's been through, it's not surprising, actually. Yeah. Um, well, fear is a massive thing. It doesn't matter what that fear is. No, it's ma- you know, yeah. fear is debilitating because that fear is a personal fear. Whatever you have, no one can understand. They can't jump in your shoes and feel the same fear. No. You know, what's going on in the language, the narrative that's going in your head, you know. And yes, fear can be irrational in some circumstances, but fear can also be so powerfully in you that it stops you doing ev- anything. Absolutely. You know, anything. Thinking clearly, acting in a right, in, you know, with purpose. And that fear can be a conversation to have with someone or something you're doing or something you're about to do. For me, like, I've lived in fear for 30 years. Yeah. Over So how do you then change that? Yeah. I was really pleased, going back to your question, it, you know, um, <laughs> airing it was so important. I felt ready. Mm-hmm. That's the main thing, you know. Two years later, I felt ready for it to come out. Um, I was pleased with how it was put together in the end because I had a, I had complete editorial kind of control, control, which is brilliant. Um, no, it was absolutely brilliant. Yeah, it it was a massive weight off of my shoulders to finally do it. It was that whole the next day. <laughs> Because <laughs> actually what had happened is they changed it around. I was meant to have the documentary and then do a newspaper article. But actually it went the other way around. around. So actually, if you remember, I did a newspaper article mm. the week before in the Sunday Mirror. So the night that before that came out, I was like, I- I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going out the door. I'm not like literally. Yeah, ever again. No, because now it's like there. It's yeah. like out. And I was thinking, oh my God. I didn't know how to feel about it. So that all came out. I got a really good response. But then it's a week till the dock. And I got asked, literally, has that come out to go on this morning with Phil yeah. and Holly? So I go on this Love morning. And, and of course, I'm still in a mess because yes. I'm like, I don't know what the re- reaction is. And remember, you put in a little bubble because you're kind of taken from home in a car, go on TV, do your TV thing, go back home. So I actually spent a week after Phil and Holly at home on my own. So it yeah. was almost like nothing's really happened. No. Because, no. Of, you know, it's like I've still got to wait till the documentary before I can actually really feel to just be me. Yeah. So that week was really surreal because everyone thought I was doing this million things, but I was just at home. Yeah, you're the first again. time I'm actually at home doing nothing. <laughs> da, 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 yeah, da, da, I was literally da, da, like twiddling my phone thinking, now what? You know, what, yeah. am I, what am I meant to do in this week? You know? So then the doc came out and um, yeah, that came out. And I have to say, you know, I've had, I've had an amazing response. Yeah. The people, I know it will be some of you that have messaged Instagram. I can't believe the response. And actually, one of the biggest things, there was two major things I needed that doctor to do. One, to free me, and that yeah. is absolutely free. And I'll go back to one of the things I did get to do was do uh, awards for Pride Awards. You've got to imagine... Okay, I'm going totally off piece here, so you can cut whatever you want. But um, you, what you have to remember, this is how disconnected it, I was from anybody actually identifying me as somebody in the community. Yeah. Because I'm on a board, I do boards, I do things on well-being, I do whatever. And to the point that the week before, I'm on uh, during that week, I'm on a board um, and... They had uh, gay pride, uh, pride sort of thing for their uh, company, and so they're giving out all the pin badges, you know, the uh, the pride flag and that to everyone on the board. I didn't put mine on, you know, and they don't notice those things. But I couldn't physically do anything like that ever. I couldn't put, you know, a pin badge on or anything that would show. You would never see me. I used to always wear black, white, and grey, you know. I'm like now colour. I'm yeah, woo. loud and brown now. Yeah. But um, <laughs> I just little things that were associated yeah. with me because I would think, oh my god, they think I'm gay. Oh my god, this is like, yeah. whatever yeah, yeah. questions. So I didn't do anything like that. So um, leading up to the documentary, it was all very like cloak and dagger with my life. You know, kind of oh, I don't want to say anything. You know, I'm on a board for diversity and inclusion, yet they don't know I'm gay. 
<laughs> you know. Yeah. So it's all those sort of things. They um, do now. They do now, and they're very happy. <laughs> 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 so um, anyway, so after the doc came out, I was really worried about what people would say. But again, it was more the fear of judgment, the fear of what people would do. And I remember saying at Pride Awards, you know, there was a lot of people who said, but, you know, people assume. I said, assumption is not freedom. Freedom's my voice. You Absolutely. can assume anything about anyone, but if you don't allow them to express who they are, that's just assuming, and you can put yeah. a really horrible label on people, or you can put a, your own narrative around that person that's really not helpful. And I just sort of stood there and said, it, it, doesn't ma- it didn't matter in my life who thought I might be gay. What no. matters is me being able to be me and live my life every day being free. That's what matters, Absolutely. not what you think about me. And so that was an po- important part of the journey, and then the rest of it has been sort of seen. I've had so many emails and messages who other people have suffered, other people who have lived their life a similar way to me, not necessarily the same story, but similar life. Yeah. How are now being open? You know, even at the Commonwealth Games last week, a really highly ranked sort of um, uh, CEO in a big governing body who's been gay. And she came up to me the other day, well, she is gay, and she came up to me the other day at the Commonwealth Games. She says, because of your doc, I'm now introducing my wife as my wife. You know, she's in her 50s. Everyone knows her, everyone's seen, but normally you say, my friends, my work colleague, my PA, my this, this, this. She says, you know, things like that, just her coming up to me. And I've known her for years. I thought, again, everybody may have knew, never questioned her, but she says... This is the first championship, and I've been to 20, that I'm, in, I'm now bringing my wife and introducing because you, of your documentary. Absolutely. And, and another one, which I'll say is really... Uh, so many, but uh, sorry. Um, it's probably I'm sorry. waving like really finished. Um, I'm, not, I'm ignoring it's black. I can't see what they're doing. Yes, exactly. I can't see at all. And I haven't got my glasses on, so... <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> can I see here? Uh, another one was really sweet, was a, a young teenager who said my mum was in the army and she's never had a conversation about me about it and she said but I knew something was wrong she hasn't had a relationship for years she hasn't done anything and after your doc I approached my mum and said what happened to you in the army she told a similar story to mine more like Emma's and being kicked out and everything and it's battled through her life and her teenager said because my doc I've gone to my mum and says I want you to find a partner I want you to live your life I want you to be you and that was a teenager she was 13 years old yeah what should we exactly? and she said my mum just cried in front of me and now we're going out and I'm getting her on these you know trying to get her a partner yeah. and trying to whatever dating and website like, oh god don't do that <laughs> <laughs> don't do that it's right left or right I don't know I've never been on terrifying. them terrifying <laughs> terrifying was it left or right one of them do it the wrong but, way yeah. oh but no but those little conversations are really yeah. nice because two things I wanted to happen was me to free myself, but also if it made a difference to others, then great. Yeah, and it has. And it is, so that's nice. Which is brilliant. Yeah. And so then there was also a thing about the, the, the LGBTQ plus community mm-hmm. and working it all out. Oh. Mm. It's a lot, isn't it? Oh, One thing I want to do here at Rockwater, yeah. and I've spoken to Luke about it, is I want to have an evening of diversity and mm-hmm. talking. Yeah. Because I don't know about anyone else, but I don't know enough. Mm-hmm. You know, and people are then frightened to do things or say something because they think they might get it wrong, so you mm. don't speak. So who would be up for coming to an evening where there's actually people that know how to say things or what we should be saying or what we should, or, you know, just to, 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 work, the, to work it out? Yeah, would you come? Hey. Luke, are you hearing this when he listens back to this podcast? Don't edit this bit. But how's it, how, is, how is the community? How's it going? Yeah, so one of the things that, again, I needed to do in the doc is because I've been very, as I said, uh, detached yeah. from it, was to just talk to people. And I did a little bit in the doc by talking to Lady Phil, who was uh, part of the sort of black, LGBT yes, she was one lovely, she was amazing, amazing woman. Um, because uh, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I used to say, "What the hell is this A B C to Z no, picking community?" I said because when yeah. I grew up, it was LGB only. There was nothing else. That's a very old attitude to have because I don't know any different. So then no. I'm seeing like all this, and I was like saying to her, "I don't get why everyone needs a label." And she said, "Because if you don't know, and this is 
this is true, you know, I mean, I kind of knew this, but I'm asking a question, is that if, let's just say, really simplistically, if you're all blue, if you're blue and you know no other blue person at all in the world, how isolating, how lonely, how everything that is, because you don't know anyone else that looks like you, okay, or thinks like you. That's exactly the same in this community. When you feel that you don't quite feel like you might feel not different is the wrong word but you are unique you are you and you don't know anyone else that's like you so by having these let's say silos rather than labels it allows you to think oh i've got a place to go i've got a community i've got friends i've got family people understand me people that i can talk to release my fears and my feelings to and that's why it's become bigger and bigger because as we know and it's never been different everyone is very different yeah in that everyone's different everyone's life is so different you know um and so one of the things that i think is important is for a conversation to happen around understanding understanding the landscape yeah i think but so. to normalize the conversation so it doesn't become uncomfortable for people as well yeah. as well as comfortable for those speaking because what i've noticed that i feel being in the position i am where people have known me as a, a speaker or inspired them or whatever i don't want people to change their attitude to me i no. want people to move forward with me you know I'm who I was, I've got all these titles, I've got whatever, that hasn't changed, but now I'm expressing more of myself that wasn't in the norm category of being, so let's say, heterosexual or whatever. Mm. If I, as a one person, can help unravel the complexities that maybe um, uh, heterosexual people might see, because remember, I've been in a world where, as far as anyone in my publicly know that I haven't fitted in this community so now I'm going well actually I am in it you know I'm here yeah you know so listen listen to me this is why people need to speak this is why people need a platform yeah so I think there's a lot of work to do yeah and I also believe that the platform isn't there to shout down anyone that doesn't listen uh, anyone that doesn't understand no it should be a way of educating and informing and having conversation yeah if we all have proper adult conversation people will understand your positioning and then you'll probably be heard and listened more and that's from listen, sitting out here and now coming in my yeah. voices that have as you say conversation where people can express where they've been what's happened to them what rights they feel they should have yeah. direction they think it's a go but do it in a way that other people can also give their opinion yeah. so that you come up with solutions yeah because solutions will change things not conflict absolutely and listening listening discussing one view is not necessarily the only view everybody has a view everyone has a story everyone has a right to be heard but we don't have a right to scream and shout no. and say it's only our thing because the next person wants their say and the next person wants theirs. So the only way we can do it is to have and educate people. So I go into a corporate who still don't necessarily have a diverse, a diverse kind of plan in place. One of the things I want to do is don't, honorary Colonel Dame Kelly Holmes, MBE, 12 times doctorate, blah, blah, yeah. blah. Honorary doctorates. Um, <laughs> um, can stand and go right this is what I've heard this is the people I'm think. you know what I, my one of my jobs is now yeah. I am not I am not the giant that people stand their shoulders on many people before me have done an amazing job to get us where we are now in this community yeah. to be respected to open to move forward I'm not that person but what I am, and I hope I am, is somebody that will be um, respected, who will listen myself and learn, who then will have a voice to make absolute changes where changes are needed. Yeah. I'm not afraid to stand up for what I believe in. And no. I do believe that every single one of us have the right to stand side by side with each other. Absolutely. I'm standing, I'll be right next to you or behind you. Okay. A huge thank you to the amazing Dame Kelly Holmes for joining us for our inaugural podcast here at Rockwater. 
It was an inspiring and emotional chat as we covered all things Kelly with our audience enthralled from the first moments. We explored themes such as freedom, empowerment, diversity, and inclusion. A beautiful evening that certainly had a huge impact on me from the moment we sat down and that you hopefully picked up on when listening to these two episodes. Make sure to tune in to our next episode when we'll be sitting down with the former professional boxer, Tony Bellew. Thank you.